video game licenses are either good, bad, legendary, forgotten, or stupid. I suppose when you look at it like that, they're just like all other games. However, these games tend to stand out just a little bit more due to the overwhelming popularity of the license. Of course, this can be a good or a bad thing, as more often than not, these games are created for the same reason a licensed toy line is created. For the monies. That's always going to be the bottom line. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that a licensed game is bad, and think what you want about the company, but one studio that's always cool to look back on when it comes to licensed video games is… Disney. Sure, you got some stinkers, but on the flip side, you have some great, sorry, scrub that, utterly fantastic games that no matter what generation you grew up with will surely have made some kind of impact on your life. Aladdin for the Mega Drive or Aladdin for the Super Nintendo? Sadly, for every great game comes a whole heap of unreleased or cancelled ones, and more often than not, these games never saw the light of day, even in preview form. Like, for instance, did you know that The Black Cauldron, Jungle Book, and Return to Oz were all in early stages of development at least back in 1985? And no, I'm not talking about the eventual release games, these were all entirely different. Yet, besides this one news article, nothing has ever come to pass, not a screen shot, a synopsis, game design plan, or even a single sheet of concept art. Disney are very protective of their properties, and I'm sure that there are more cancelled games that never left the development floor, let alone mentioned in interviews, and because of that, today I plan to look at Disney video games that all got cancelled, and for the most part, the stupid reason as to why that thing happened. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. Hey there guys, hope you're enjoying the video. Before going ahead, here's a question. Are you getting bored of the same old bog standard back alley spaghettis? Have you now come to the realization that the gray stuff isn't all that delicious? Then perhaps saying hello to something Fresh. is the way to go. And together with this week's sponsor, we invite you to be our guest and take your taste buds soaring around the world to explore a huge variety of different global flavours that would even put the world showcase to shame. If you're like me, a busy family man, then I suggest the family friendly box. Or go the distance with the fit option. The wholesome option is even more wholesome than Tiana's dead dad's gumbo. Or if you're more of a lazy Susan, then the quick and easy meals are going to be perfect for you. There is something for everyone with HelloFresh. Yes, even the pickiest reviewers that you can find. In fact, sorry Gustos, but HelloFresh has more five star rated reviews than any other meal kit. So you always know you're going to be getting something delicious. So grab Grab your dingle hopper and break the internet with code POGSGRJUNE16 for up to 16 free meals, plus surprise gifts across six HelloFresh boxes. Plus on top of that, you get free shipping too. And once you click, my description will live update to count up the purchases. Gifts include free appetizers, free desserts, and free premium recipes. Let's start off by angering the majority of my subscriber base in 3, 2, 1. The Atari 2600, for the most part, isn't very good. It has some good games, heck it even has some great games, but the vast, vast, vast majority of titles are just simply not worth revisiting these days. That, of course, is not taken away from its impact on gaming as a whole. Heck, you could even say the same thing about my beloved home computer games on systems like the Amstrad CPC and ZX Spectrum. Again, they do indeed have great games on them, but for the most part, they had terrible, clunky, and quite frankly, not enjoyable games as a whole. For me, the majority of these games are just one generation behind games that are still very much enjoyable to play. The games from this era are very much more historical and curiosity pieces for someone like me. But again, like I said, not everything is forgettable, because when a genuinely good game is made for these systems, it quickly stands out in a swamp of terrible copycats and because of that, quickly becomes legendary. 
And if you ask me, even though this system had some serious limitations forcing you to fill in the gaps yourself using your imagination, it still had some rather impressive games too that passers-by would be able to look at and instantly recognise what you're playing. And one of the best examples of this was the unreleased Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The game was going to be part of the Atari Kids library and even on the title screen did actually display some rather impressive calligraphy for the name. You then see the Seven Dwarfs aka your seven lives or attempts at trying to save Snow White from the Wicked Witch who's getting closer and closer as seen at the top of the screen. You then run through a damn 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 impressive looking mine collecting gems on the way to save the upcoming princess whilst hearing the iconic jingles from the iconic soundtrack. Next you have a very basic but buggy platforming stage that definitely needed a bit more work done to it. This requires you to go from left to right similar to a 2D Frogger title on harder settings. You can actually fire the gems that you've already collected on the previous stage up at the bats. You then enter the evil forest from the movie where the dwarf must find the correct path indicated by flashing dots on the bottom of the screen and of course you must do this before the witch reaches Snow White. And that's it. So what happened? Well, not a whole lot. The marketing team at Disney slash Atari knew they had something special here with this unfinished game. They didn't know which part of the game to develop further. They simply couldn't decide what part was best. Although, as I'm sure you can all agree, it already worked perfectly well as a fully packaged game. The end result was for Greg to shelve it and wait whilst they decided what to do with it. And they spent so bloody long trying to make that decision that by this point he had left the company to work on a another game that was also never finished or released, the guy seriously did not have much luck, did he? However, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky, there is actually another version of this game that came out a year later, which is presumably based off the feedback from Disney or Atari, and this version is utterly terrible. Thankfully, the 1983 video game crash came a knock in soon after, and we never got to play this dog turd reworking, which completely destroyed the impressive original design that Greg originally created. You ever wonder what the bottom of an Avatar shoe looks like? Well, bam! There it is. Ah, the Kinect. That thing we all went crazy for until we actually played it. Back when Xbox was finally given us something from Rare, which no doubt helped the sales of that bad boy and then some, before it became a heap of wires behind your telly you quickly forgot about. But Microsoft didn't. With Kinect, we made you the controller. Oh, come on, Microsoft. Will you never learn? Jokes aside, guys, as much as this double-ended device may be a sore spot for us early adopters, in the right hand, it can actually be a rather impressive bit of kit. But forget all that, none of it matters because did you know that a little known studio known as Heavy Iron Studios were tasked by Disney to create a game based within the world of Disneyland? And that game was called E-Ticket. In the preview, we can see our guests entering the world of Adventureland, exploring the overly detailed world that Heavy Iron had made recreating the park, and you can even get your picture taken with Winnie the Pooh, as well as going to conduct a little orchestra thing with the iconic Tiki Birds. But without a doubt, the most impressive part of this demo was the Jungle Cruise. As Donald takes you along your journey, your stunning looking journey I might add, characters could reach out and grab butterflies whilst iconic Disney characters came in from the left and the right. You then fight off crocodiles whilst Donald tries to steal a couple of gems. You get to squirt water at monkeys and finally you need to copy the actions of a huge gorilla in order to intimidate him and that's the end of the preview. And no, there's absolutely no mention of the backside of water anywhere in this demo. It's a Disneyland joke. If I explain it, it won't be funny. If you know it, you know it. 
besides the absence of a water's behind, it looks really well made. Not just the ride section itself, but also the entire Disneyland slash world hub. So what was the problem? Well, I think this one's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yep. Another game was released that was pretty much the exact same thing, but this one was done by another studio called Frontier Studios. Now, according to the developer on this unreleased version of the game, who was kind enough to give me some feedback, he informed me that development on the title was absolute hell. The team would get nothing but constant backlash from the producer at Microsoft Studios that was in charge of the project, constantly telling them that it needs to look better, it needs to look better, it needs to look better. Nothing they could do would ever please the guy at Microsoft Studios, yet, when you look at it for an early mock-up, it's arguably better looking than what was eventually released. Either way, these guys never got the deal, and it was believed by the dev that I spoke to that they never were going to be getting the deal either. The guy at Microsoft Studios that looked after this title simply wanted them to make a prototype so that Microsoft could pass it on to a studio that they already had a relationship with. The relentless asking for the team to go back and make it look better over and over and over again, even though arguably it did look better than what was eventually released. It got so bad that by the end, the team were happy to lose the contract. In short, it was a lost leader. They were never going to be getting that contract. Microsoft Studios just needed someone good enough to make the concept so that they could get the go ahead and make the game with someone else. Which actually isn't a million miles away from this. This was the studio's attempt at making a Toy Story 3 game, and this is the never-before-seen mock-up box art for that game. For this one, the studio ended up taking their working pitch to Pixar and presenting it in front of all of the usual big boys, such as John Lasseter, whereas the studio they were up against had nothing but storyboards. It was an obvious win for them, right? No. They still lost the battle against that studio too. Why? because that studio was owned by Disney at the time. Avalanche Studios. Now look, it is worth pointing out that this section is very much an opinion piece, but it's an opinion piece that comes from the developer who worked on these demos. Thankfully in this instance, it ended up the right way, as Avalanche Studios' Toy Story 3 actually ended up working out brilliantly. It's an awesome game, and even though Heavy Iron Studios didn't get this one, the Toy Story 3 demo did get them up, which again, is a surprisingly well-made co-op platform adventure game. So, um, win-win? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know, guys. When looking back at the amazing lineup of Disney video games that you guys remember, it's easy to forget that these games are created to do one thing. Sell, sell, sell. Okay, that's three sells right there. One, to sell copies of the game, of course. Two, to help the sales of the movie or show and three, vice versa. And although you may remember these games fondly, there was a time that the line definitely got blurred. No longer was a licensed video game, especially on a Disney property, a surefire good thing, it was pretty much guaranteed to be a bad thing. And because of this, you may be surprised to hear that at least 10 Pirates of the Caribbean games exist. The Curse of the Black Pearl for GBA scored badly. Pirates of the Caribbean for Xbox scored ever so slightly better, but still not great. The Pirates multiplayer game for mobile is virtually impossible to find online, but did get a positive response, but again, it was a mobile thing. The DS and PSP Dead Man's Chess game got average scores, as did 2006's The Legend of Jack Sparrow. <laughs> this one was actually published by Bethesda and Ubisoft, by the way. At World's End did no better, pretty much 50 to 60% all round. And finally, the online MMORPG also got very mixed reviews, although that one has had a bit of a resurgence in recent years from younger fans who remember it fondly. And that's it. At the very best, you're going to be getting an okay experience here because nothing screams out to you, which is a real shame. 
the world created by the ride and eventually those movies, especially the first, are ones of absolute wonder. Disney did such a great job casting and building and shooting these movies, and the reason these games keep getting made is because we want to explore them. Thankfully, it was the Kingdom Hearts franchise that really did show Disney that video games could be more than that. You can't blame the development team for the most part, these games had tight deadlines and strict policies brought in by the mouse house resulting in subpar experiences, but now, maybe, just maybe, if we actually spent the time, the effort and the money to make a quality game, then maybe, we can make something that's actually good to go along with our good movies. Shh, not you, not you, not you. It was this thought process that resulted in Disney actually forming their own, or in some cases acquiring their own, video game studios under the Disney Interactive Studios banner. And surprisingly, these games were actually really, really good. And surprisingly again, not all of these games even included official Disney properties. Quite a few damn good and memorable games came from this era of Disney and two games that were in joint development at the time were Tron Evolution and Pirates of the Caribbean Armada of the Damned. Now this Pirates game was to be very different than the previous entries in that it was a game set within the Pirates world instead of being a game that was based inside the movie's storylines. You don't play as Jack, you are your own pirate, set before the events of the first movie, who is killed and then resurrected in order to plunder all that typical pirate booty. Taking a fable sort of approach, the game played out based on the decisions that you made in the game. Very few set pieces and music scores would be used in the game from these movies, and almost no returning characters besides a mini cameo here or there would make a return at all. This may sound like a recipe for disaster, but in actual fact, the idea was to create something completely unique and something that would stand on its own rather than being shoehorned into the random movie action shots. The game was also headed by Dan Touch of Dragon Age Origins fame, and of course, it was cancelled. Even though this almost finished game was heavily talked about and very well reviewed after it was shown off at E3, only four months later, it was cancelled. And the reason? Disney couldn't work out how to publish games. In order to make their dent, they had several studios under their belts all at the same time and everything pumped out was good, but didn't exactly set the world on fire. Take these mammoth projects and compare them with the money being made by third party studios on mobile and it's easy to see why Disney wasn't exactly thrilled. This resulted in the studio firing almost everyone, cancelling pirates and then rushing Tron Evolution with the remaining demoralised skeleton crew of developers who all knew the writing was on the wall. What Disney should have done in hindsight was create one, maybe two awesome games, give them the love they needed during development and then of course market them right before starting the next big game and then, well, maybe one or two more titles in development. Build up slowly, Disney. Don't just buy everything and then release everything all in one go. It's never going to work for you. Take your time and release a game that stands the test of time. Which they actually did. With Disney Infinity. This was the real reason why so many games that we do and do not know about got cancelled. They needed to focus on just one game and they did that with Disney Infinity and although that too eventually got cancelled, for the people out there that played this when it was out in its heyday, they'll all tell you that this was probably the best Toys to Life experience ever made. It's just a shame that so many other awesome games got cancelled including this one. Epic Donald. Make sure you hit subscribe, people, because what you're seeing right here is actually never before seen footage of the Epic Mickey spin-off game. Epic Donald that was recently sent in to me by an anonymous fan of the show, and that's all I've got to say about that. So don't even ask.
Hey there guys, thank you all so much for checking out this video. It was a completely randomly edited video, this one. Uh, I just went crazy this last week, just collecting all of this information from people like the guy who worked on the Disneyland um, e-ticket game, uh, the people that worked on the uh, uh, Epic Donald game. I am trying to just put this information together and give it out to Patreons as a little bit of an extended version, including the interview and all that sort of stuff, but I am needing to get all of that confirmed with the people. It's been a crazy week for collecting all this and um yeah i hope you liked seeing some of this exclusive stuff and you know hearing these crazy stories um it was really really fun uh researching this one and yeah guys thank you all so much for checking it out so this is the part of the video i'd like to give a massive shout out to all of my patreons and youtube members with an extra big shout out going to uh these following patreons and youtube members links all down below guys aaron gorman akatimo 84 andrew dalton arista benjamin guy big rico B uh, boots and Pup, Bram Perez, Chev Matic, Christopher Devero, Clomba, uh, Clan Bob, Conrad Constantine, De Action Saxon, Dina, Dina81, Game Apologist, Gary Pinkett, Ian Quell, Intrigued Gaming, Attacky Teacher, The Ashen Knight, Jay's Man Child, Jabba Al Aiden, James, Jeff Mianowski, Jeremy Bauer, Jeremy Rodriguez, King Link Reviews, King of Carrot Flower, Lucas Softail, Man Shovel, Matt Jackson, Michael Ridley Dash, Mike Fallon, Mind of the Unsane, Nicholas Burtner, Nick Pollard, Over Giles Zane, Roll VP, Ray Blair, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, Richard Alderjig, Roven Army, uh, Sir Nilsson, Shade Silent, Shadow Dragon, Sh uh, Shapey, Solid's Captor, Taylor Rainwater, That Gamer, The Cunning Linguist, The Old Man Cometh, the Sneaky Ferret, Tim Lunn, Todd Paul Float G, Vitas Varnes, Vike Echoes, What Will Been, The Wonder Ducks, and Ye Old Ham Burglar. Like I said, guys, thank you all so, so much. All of these names you see down here, these are the people that support me every single month, and they allow me to just keep, you know, doing the stuff that I'm doing right here. So if you like this sort of stuff, you can obviously become a Patreon or YouTube member too. There's links down below for that. Or simply a like, a comment, a uh, subscribe. Um, if you ever share it on any kind of social media or Reddit or anything like that, all of these things help this channel enormously the channel is definitely going up and it's because you guys are doing those exact things thank you so so much i love this and i'm really chuffed that you guys come back to watch it so much love to you all this is dj soap signing out and hopefully i'll see you all next time bye bye